Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Operationalized Predictive Analytics, How Data Science Teams Can Close the Insight to Action Gap. I'm Haley Matisa with RapidMiner, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'm joined today by Mike Gualtieri, Principal Analyst at Forrester. serving application development and delivery professionals. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Mike's research focuses on software technology, platforms, and practices that enable technology professionals to deliver precinct digital experiences and breakthrough operational efficiency. His key technology and platform coverage areas are big data and IoT strategy, Hadoop, Spark, predictive analytics, streaming analytics, and prescriptive analytics, machine learning, data science, and emerging technologies that make software faster and smarter. Mike is also a leading expert on the intersection of business strategy, architecture, design, and creative collaboration. Mike has more than 25 years of experience in the industry, helping firms design and develop mission-critical applications in e-commerce, e insurance, banking, manufacturing, healthcare, and scientific research for organizations including NASA, eBay, Bank of America, Liberty Mutual, Nielsen, EMC, and others. He has written thousands of lines of code, managed development teams, and consulted with dozens of technology firms on product, marketing, and R&D strategy. Mike earned a BS in Computer Science and Management from Worcester Polytech Institute. While a student, Mike was awarded three U.S. patents for inventing an expert system used to train air traffic controllers around the world. We're also joined today by one of our own product experts, Lars Boyerle. Welcome, Lars. Hi, everyone. Lars is the Chief Product Officer here at RapidMiner. He's a strategic and innovative product leader with 20 years of product and operational experience in enterprise software and analytics business intelligence markets. Mike and Lars will get started in just one minute, but first, a few housekeeping for our audience. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the on-demand version via email within the next one to two business days. You are free to share that link with colleagues as well who are not able to join on the line today. Second, if you have any trouble with audio or video, please send a note through the form of question in the Q&A box, and someone on our technical team will respond back to you. Finally, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Please feel free to ask questions at any time via the questions panel on your screen. We'll leave time at the end to get to everyone's questions. Okay, that's enough from me. Now I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Haley, and welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Walteri, Principal Analyst at Forrester, and I want to talk to you today about advanced analytics and operationalizing advanced analytics. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is priority, and based upon our data, uh, we found that 85% of enterprises are planning, implementing, or expanding uh, the use of advanced analytics. And there's a simple reason for that. Uh, advanced analytics results in more knowledge. Um, and that knowledge comes in the forms of insights and historical analytics, or it comes in the form of uh, predictive models. And to get that knowledge, you need analytics. Um, and our perspective at Forrester is that there's four key broad types of analytics that all companies need. Uh, the first one is descriptive analytics, and that's really your traditional BI, your reports, your dashboards um, on your historical information. And most firms have invested collectively billions of dollars um, on descriptive analytics. If you look to the right, there's the advanced analytics, um, predictive, streaming, which is real-time analytics, and prescriptive analytics. And these constitute uh, the advanced analytics. And what's interesting um, is the momentum uh, that advanced analytics, the use of advanced analytics has in enterprises. You can see from this comparison between 2014 and 2015, uh, for example, look at predictive. Uh, look at the change um, in companies that report using predictive location, streaming analytics, the advanced analytics. So there's an enormous amount of uh, momentum because there's a lot of value uh, in, those, in those analytics. Um, the good news about this chart is that it's still less than 50% reporting using it, right? So for companies that, that, that aren't uh, using uh, these advanced analytics, uh, there's still plenty of opportunity to do it before their competitors use it. Now, advanced analytics, I mean, analytics is a bit of a misnomer, right? Because analytics 
is about information and insight that human decision makers can use, but it's also about applications. And, and that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about how can we take those insights and those models and inject them um, into applications uh, so they can make those applications smarter. Enterprises have access to plenty of data. Um, we've done a recent survey showing that, that organizations have plenty of data, but that they only analyze less than 20% of that data. They only use 20% of that data. Uh, but in order to make their applications smarter, more personalized, um, they need to inject uh, those analytics uh, in those applications. So most application development organizations, the design organizations, they don't think of, oh, how can I use analytics or models in my application? They really should, right? And, and so you know, what data scientists need to do is they need to find a way of injecting and making those applications uh, much smarter. And you know, there's dozens and dozens of examples of how companies are injecting analytics. Um, one is a, a trading. Uh, for financial services for firms. Um, what sort of models can they do to uh, look at market data, to look at social media data, to find out um, what sort of equities that they could trade, trading on good news, trading on bad news. Uh, the whole world of IoT, uh, all of that sensor data, how can we analyze that data, create models and advanced analytics to determine if something's wrong, something's right, uh, what's happening, um, uh, based upon those sensors and those devices. Um, there's also location analytics that can be used in conjunction with predictive analytics to make recommendations. Uh, what if in real time, you know, these shoppers enter a mall? Do you make them an offer? Maybe you don't make them an offer uh, because, you know, their beh behavioral analytics shows that they are going to buy anyway. Uh, so save that 10% uh, to your bottom line. So there's plenty of ways to use analytics and embed them in applications, but you can't do it unless you can efficiently operationalize those analytics. Um, so the good news is that data scientists know how to create <laughs> these advanced analytics and know how to create models. Um, and they use a combination of statistical and machine learning algorithms in conjunction with uh, predictive analytics tools to find those patterns, to find those models. But if they're finding those models and patterns at their desk, um, Again, that's not doing any good in the oper operational business. And data scientists have an amazing set of skills uh, to be able to find these models that have great, great business value. Uh, but again, they have to be able to operationalize them because they're being judged not on the model, but on the business model that, that accrues uh, based upon that model. And the reality is, is that data scientists and organizations in general struggle to make those insights actionable. They struggle to operationalize uh, those insights. And you know, some of the problems uh, with that have to do with creating a model and deploying it and then monitoring that. Um, a, a model that uh, data scientists create often has to be translated to code that will run within the target application. So if there's, a, if there's a beautiful model that needs to run an ERP system, uh, can that ERP system accommodate the code of the model to do the scoring uh, in real time? If it's a web application, how is that model going to be, be run? Um, many models can be called via a service um, outside the application, but that will introduce latency in the model. Um, you know, PMML, uh, which is predictive uh, market modeling language, uh, can limit the methods and algorithms. So PMML is a standard uh, that, that some people use to, to deploy models, but that can often uh, limit the methods and the algorithms used to find the most accurate model, right? So there's a problem with that as well. Um, and the models usually don't include or deploy monitoring code. You know, there's no data scientist that's just going to hand over a model and say, this model is good forever. No. I mean, that model, it, you know, depending upon the application, that model may be good for a day. It may be good for six months. I mean, the point is, is that once you deploy a model, it has to be monitored. Um, it has to be retrained on a frequent basis. But often deploying that model, there's no code that, that, that can easily monitor that model. So the solution really is to streamline uh, this entire uh, data science process, the, the, the process of discovering a model, 
and the process of deploying that model and monitoring that model. And so there's a few requirements, uh, general requirements that you have that, that data scientists and the organization at large has to have. Those models, number one, to be able to scale to handle high volume applications and streaming data. Okay, the key there is that this model isn't being used to create a report. This is an operational model, which means it's going in an application. And that application, for example, if it's, a, if it's an e-commerce application, has to scale to tens, hundreds, millions of users, right? Um, so however that model is deployed, it has a requirement to be able to handle and scale and score at high volume. Um, it also has to be able to access all of the data that's needed at time of scoring. So you think of the model as taking inputs and then doing a score, or doing some sort of an output, but what about those inputs, right? The, it, it can be very, very difficult to um, extract those inputs from the underlying systems and the underlying applications uh, where those the, they originate um, in a flash. So the models can't just be, here's the pure model, but the model also has to include methods and code for being able to access the variable variables uh, that it needs at the time of scoring. Um, uh, Operation, operationalizing models means getting those models into the applications where they're most valuable. So it has to work seamlessly within complex heterogeneous enterprise environments. Okay, this isn't sort of an internet startup with hundreds of programmers that can just sort of make anything happen in any period of time. This is an enterprise. This is an enterprise that has built up a portfolio of hundreds and sometimes thousands of applications, for example, at a bank. And how are you going to get that model in all of those heterogeneous applications. So you can't just have one deployment model and, uh, and, and force it in. Um, it has to work seamlessly uh, with all of the applications. Um, and then finally, um, you have to be able to embed those models in IoT applications, mobile applications, web applications, and as I've been talking about, enterprise applications. And when you think about the different um, technical challenges. Uh, these aren't technical challenges that a data scientist should be tasked with, or even an application development group, right? Because that's going to impede, that creates friction uh, from the time that the model is created uh, till the time that it gets deployed in the application. All right, so there's, there's just the, the pure level of effort that has to go into doing this, but there's also uh, the time to market. Um, you know, models may have a very short lifespan before they have to be retrained. So the time from model to deployment has to be streamlined. It has to be as short as possible. Um, so companies are making very, very big investments in data science. You can see there's, you know, from that data slide that there's a lot of adoption and momentum in the advanced analytics. But companies should not make that investment or as they make that investment, they should also think about, okay, I've got a brilliant model. How am I actually going to use it to make a difference in my business? So operationalizing advanced analytics um, is, is a critical piece of this. And once companies can do that, um, they'll be able to have a complete set of analytics that can inform applications and make a measurable uh, impact on the business in both descriptive, predictive, streaming, and prescriptive analytics. So again, I'm Mike Walteri. Uh, thank you for your time. I am now going to hand this over to Lars, who's going to go a little bit deeper on uh, the mechanics of how you operationalize advanced analytics. Lars? Thank you, Mike. And uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, what I then will uh, talk about here is how we at Rapid Miner uh, provide a predictive analytics platform uh, that has uh, the feature set here that Michael described. Uh, we make it quite easy for people to build predictive models on these type of projects and then also operationalize those models uh, into the business to maximize uh, your outcome or, or the value. And we do this uh, through a platform that can access lots of different data sources, provides a rich layer of data preparation tools and capabilities, uh, the ability to model them and uh, even more so validate and really figure out what your models can do. 
and then take it to the operationalization or the deployment of these models into business systems uh, and a, a variety, in a variety of ways, which I will uh, describe a bit more. And uh, our product here on the platform provides some very unique capabilities. Uh, on one end, it's a very easy to use, and I'll give you a little demonstration here to get you introduced to the product. Uh, it's very effortless to go ahead and build up uh, some of these models. It's also very powerful and has a lot of functionality, making it very fast to develop uh, predictive models uh, and manage that life cycle. And we'll dive pretty deep into the operationalization here. It's, it's quite straightforward has a lot of nice features to uh, do those things. Uh, everything from uh, deploying the models, uh, scheduling things, uh, managing the models over time, as uh, Michael described. And lastly, uh, the product is uh, founded on an open source uh, core, and uh, it comes with a great community of users. Uh, there's a, a marketplace as well where people build up on and contribute and add additional features and functionality that's available. So it provides a very rich platform with new innovative capabilities around big data and uh, new machine learning, etc. Uh, next we'll do a demonstration here of Rapid Miner. Uh, let me switch over and uh, jump right into the Rapid Miner Studio product. Uh, here, what we'll do now is actually analyze some data related to the Titanic accident, which hopefully many of you are familiar with. Uh, what I will do is just go out and uh, add that data to Rapid Miner first. And as I'm doing that, uh, the product immediately looks at the information, starts to uh, assign data types that I can also, as a user, make any changes uh, to that uh, to see and make sure I load the data the way I want it to be loaded. Yeah, I can make any of these changes afterwards as well, but in this first step, it's uh, a pretty easy part and a uh, good point to do some of that. So uh, let's uh, now uh, add that data to Rapid Miner here, and we immediately uh, can see that it contains a number of records of passengers. They were in different classes. We got their names, their age. Uh, we know uh, whether they entered a lifeboat or not. Uh, so a lot of good information here that can help us determine here what made uh, or what characteristics of these passengers uh, made them survive. So that's what we will build a model around. Uh, what I'm doing here is taking a look at some of the statistical information then. Uh, it's a view that shows me per attribute uh, if there are any missing values in the data, which there are here around age, for example. Also, we can see further down that the cabin number is missing from a lot of the passengers. Uh, and so also, the lifeboat here indicates that there are 800 records that are missing values. And in fact, that is actually uh, the 800 people that did not make it onto a lifeboat. And we can see here total two, there's 1,309 rows of data or passengers. Uh, so what we will start to do now is use Rapid Miner to clean up this data sum and then apply a predictive model. In this case, we'll use a decision tree to see what characteristics uh, identify people that survived and, and those that didn't. Uh, so let's jump into actually building a process here then of, of doing that. So we'll take our data set, and what we wanted to do was to first uh, clean up the data. What Rapid Miner does uh, is it uh, provides a lot of help for users in learning the product. Uh, for one example, uh, it provides a lot of good getting started information where you can learn the basic mechanics of the product, how to import data, build processes, and so on. Uh, and then it has a great set of tutorials here that will allow you to learn more about the product and how to do 
data cleansing and preparation and then applying models, etc. Uh, just good to know. What we'll do now, though, is start to build up this process. And uh, as we saw, the data here again had a number of uh, problems. So we'll go and address that. First, we'll actually go and exclude a few of these uh, attributes. We don't really need them because they're missing a lot of values. Uh, we'll go in and add or replace some missing values for age here, and then we'll have a pretty good data set to, to work with. Uh, as I'm then starting to do those types of operations, at the bottom of the screen here, you can see something called recommended operators. Uh, this is a, a, a part of the system that can recommend to you as a user what might be a suitable operation to take based on what you've done so far. And these recommendations are based on the common usage of lots of users. Uh, we call it wisdom of the crowds. We are, in fact, uh, if you opt in, collect some data on your usage. Uh, it's anonymized, and then we apply machine learning to that to see and, and sort of pr uh, recommend what, what are good next steps. Well, in this case, let's start here then with the select attributes. So basically, what we're going to do is define which of the attributes we want to use in our model development. In this case, then, uh, we'll exclude the ticket number. It's kind of an ID, which is similar to the name. Uh, we also saw before that cabin missed a lot of values and that lifeboat did so as well. And in fact, the lifeboat is a pretty strong indication to whether you survived or not. So we'll exclude that column. Okay, and now uh, the next thing we wanted to do uh, was to replace some of the missing H values there, or all of them, in fact. And what you can do in Rapid Miner here is search for a number of types of operators, and we have lots of them that can perform uh, many good operations on the data. And in this case, we'll take a replace missing value one. And here, what we will do is for uh, age, we will uh, decide then to replace all the missing values by the average age in the data set. You could choose other things. And in fact, you could also create a model that might predict even better what the right age of the particular passenger might be. But in this case, we'll use just average. Okay, well, let's run this process now. We have excluded a few attributes. Uh, we've reduced those. You can now see, too, that for age here, we've replaced all the missing values. And what we have left then are a couple of attributes which have a one and a two respectively then missing values. And what we will do with those is actually simply filter out those rows. And again, we can look at our recommenders here, recommended operations, and the filter shows up here, so we'll use it. And uh, here we'll in fact filter out any row that's missing a, an attribute value. Very, very simple. Uh, last couple things here, I will also do something called set role, uh, which is an operation that identifies which, in this case, column we want to use as, uh, to predict. And in this case, it will be whether you survived or not. Uh, and we'll call that a label. Uh, that means we're now using that as a predictive or the predicted uh, column. In fact, we're going to build the model then around uh, the attributes of the other uh, pieces of data and then see who survived or not. Uh, so we have done that. And then, yeah, let's uh, find and apply a decision tree here. And we'll use that as uh, our uh, algorithm to develop the model. OK, well, let's run this. And what we get then is a decision tree that depicts uh, the factors here of uh, how or why people survived or did not survive. We can see here that the gender is a very, uh, or is the key factor. If you were a male, uh, a lot of the males uh, did perish and only uh, a few males survived, and they had paid here. We can see the passenger fare, fare if they paid over $387. Uh, 
they uh, would have survived. Now for uh, the females, uh, the story is a bit different. Here, in fact, the number of siblings or spouses that you had with you on board determined whether you survived or not. And if you had a large family, basically, uh, a lot of those women did not survive. Now, we can speculate to why that happened, but could have been because uh, they were trying to get the whole family together before they approached uh, some of the boats, or the lifeboats, for example. And in any case, you can see here how it's pretty easy with Rapid Miner to get your data into the system, uh, apply a number of data cleansing and, and uh, preparation operations, and then a predictive model. Uh, you saw, too, that we had some nice recommendations at the bottom that makes it easier to find the right operator to use, as well as some of this early training material. So a very quick way, an easy way to get started with this. What we want to do now, though, is to talk a little bit about how we take a model like the one we just created and how we can deploy it to the rest of uh, your business, or in fact using more of the platform to uh, operationalize uh, this model. What, what we will do then is uh, get into this particular area of the product. We talked earlier about some of the strengths of it and operationalizing your models is, is one. Here uh, we are uh, going to dive in a bit more into the strength of it around the scheduling and event-driven uh, model execution. And we'll talk about how easily it is to embed these models into other systems, whether they're data visualizations or BI tools, uh, enterprise applications, or even business processes. And then uh, we'll also talk about how uh, the system can do some self-learning or model management to uh, dynamically and, and continuously update the model based on how the business is changing. Yeah. So when you operationalize things, uh, you can do it at different uh, levels of integration or automation, which is sort of on the x-axis here, and uh, also times uh, plays in, like how frequently or how fast do you need to use this model. So take, for example, uh, a churn scoring model. So you want to uh, see if customers are potential churners or they might churn. And now you could run that, you know, once a day and update your customer list based on the activities that they have engaged in during that day or that week. Uh, that, of course, uh, will give you some uh, ability to take actions. Uh, in some industries, that might be just fine. Uh, but the next step would be to do it based on a trigger or an event. So let's say instead of doing it at the end of the day or the end of the week, uh, you actually rescore customers when they have done something with you. Maybe they went to uh, your website and downloaded a white paper. Uh, now you could look at that and rescore that customer. Uh, maybe they are then uh, becoming more of an interesting prospect to upsell them on a particular new capability or a new offering that you have related to the information they were interested in. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you would have systems uh, which really react immediately on event data uh, as it, it's happening. Uh, Mike gave a good example of uh, customers entering a mall or right when you do the purchase at the point of sale, you could provide a recommendation uh, for the customer to maybe buy something extra. Now that requires even higher speed and more uh, a, a quicker response. And at the most high speed of all, I, I would say today in the industry is, let's say, algorithmic trading. And in this case, you also probably need a lot more uh, IT infrastructure and even uh, some of these uh, complex event processing systems and et, et cetera in order to make sure that this works really, really fast. So it's a 
fairly broad spectrum here on the time scale, uh, but all of this uh, classifies as various uh, ways of deploying and operationalizing your system. So let's walk through then how uh, we would do this in, in Rapid Miner. So I briefly gave you a demonstration of the first phase here, which if you keep clicking, uh, we can uh, access data, uh, prepare it, we develop a model, and now we come to the deployment option. Uh, once we have a model, uh, or in one of these processes that I had created there, we can push that out to the Rapid Miner server. On the server, uh, we have functionality then to uh, integrate it with other systems. There are web services there, uh, there are ways to integrate directly with applications, uh, which would allow us to tie that model then into those systems. As you get new data, uh, the model can score it, and then through these uh, interfaces or integrations, we can then communicate with other applications. So please push the button again. Uh, here are a, a variety of those. Uh, for example, uh, Rapid Miner has its own uh, web application environment where you could uh, build applications that, that users can use uh, in order to uh, use the models. Uh, you can integrate with data visuals like click view or Tableau. Uh, you can at the I API level also integrate with uh, server, Java applications, uh, uh, mobile devices, and we also have uh, out of the box uh, connectivity to different systems like salesforce.com, for example. Uh, but let's take a, f a further uh, look into that. So please click the next slide. Uh, here, uh, I am then looking at uh, some of the further functionality of the server. Uh, in particular, uh, we should look at uh, uh, some of the mechanisms that allow you to monitor the system, uh, manage uh, users and who has access rights, etc. cetera. Uh, we also have, and we'll dive even deeper into the model management capability uh, but also collaboration, for example, where different uh, users uh, could build models. We can share them centrally. Uh, other people in the organization can pick up from there and uh, do some of the integration work, let's say, with some of the systems on the right. Uh, what's also uh, critical here is the ability to do bidirectional integration with other systems. Uh, for example, uh, take a data visualization tool like uh, Click View. Here you might have a dashboard or an application that shows sales data, uh, but you want to provide some forecasting as part of that. Uh, well, that application could then uh, pass some of its data over to Rapid Miner, where we've built a forecasting model. Uh, it can then run through and deliver back to the uh, click view environment a, uh, a set of data that it can then display in showing what uh, some of the forecasts look like. And you could do that dynamically because maybe people are wanting to sub-segment their data uh, and, and run it on that particular data set. Uh, so allows for uh, bi-directional communication here. And, and again, can be done with a number of different systems uh, and be very tightly integrated. Uh, the key uh, mechanism here uh, is that Rapid Miner can very easily turn any of the processes built here and any of the models into an exposed web service, uh, which makes it quite uh, straightforward to integrate with pretty much any system. Okay, let's take uh, a look at the model management then next. So here, basically, we're showing how uh, once we've integrated a couple of systems uh, or a system with Rapid Miner, as it runs, then you will obviously create new data and new things are happening. Uh, we can feed that back into the system and uh, start to use that data, run the modeling processes again, evaluate uh, the new models versus the old ones, and decide then if we want to deploy uh, maybe an updated version 
back into the system and use that instead. Uh, so Rapid Miner facilitates that kind of a workflow, and it can be fully automated, or you might want to put in some triggers here to indicate if a model, uh, a new model might be a little bit better than the old one, and then decide uh, whether you want to deploy that or not. Uh, but uh, you can do a wide range of automation here. Well, let me now step through a few other uh, examples here and of what this could look like. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we'll look at some data uh, that comes from the government. Uh, it's uh, information about uh, auto accidents and how they have uh, uh, resulted in uh, yeah, various, uh, again, uh, uh, whether the accident was severe or, or not, what car was used lots of attributes around the conditions of, of that situation. Uh, and uh, with Rapid Miner, then, you can develop a, a number of pieces here to take such information and develop a, an operational application. Here are a few uh, screenshots, then, of uh, getting the data in, preparing it, and, in fact, doing some pretty advanced data preparation where in many data sets, sometimes you find the data coded. You've got to look up other tables of information to decode it or put it into some language that humans can understand. And this is an example of that. Right? You can build some pretty advanced data preparation uh, within the product here. And once you've done that, then uh, we also apply and do some uh, modeling, uh, also some validation here, making sure the performance of the models uh, are, are as good as we hope they are. Uh, and then uh, once we have this, we go into this uh, phase of operationalizing things. In this case, we're building a prescriptive application, basically one, uh, an application where I can enter a number of constraints and we will then apply the predictive model as well as optimize around those constraints to find a car that is uh, most optimal for my type of driving uh, and has the, then the, the, the lowest accident rate. So we built all this up and we can push this out then into a web-based application through our web services. So all those processes that I built there, I can pick any of them and then start to expose them here as a web service. And, and everything done here is through a graphical interface, right? It's now all, all ready to be used and consumed by some other application. In our case here, then, we built an, an application with the Rapid Miner web application and toolkit. And uh, this application now allows me to enter a number of parameters here. Uh, that would be then sent back to the Rapid Miner uh, model and optimization routines and find an optimal vehicle for my particular driving needs. So, you know, if I go here and, for example, set this to uh, be for a young person who likes to drive very fast, might live out in the Seattle area where it's rainy and wet, well, what kind of vehicle uh, would uh, reduce my risk of having a fatal accident. Well, it turns out it's a Datsun, a compact utility. Uh, so that would be uh, the best choice in that case. Uh, maybe in, instead then I'm a retired ranger out in Arizona driving around in dry or dusty, muddy conditions and things like that. Well, what kind of truck or car would be applicable in that case? Again, uh, the whole rapid miner models and optimizations then that we showed in the earlier screens will go through and find the best car in that case. So a, a pretty simple example, but uh, hopefully illustrative on what a prescriptive application can look like and how you could operationalize that. You could easily replace this with, let's say, a loan application or uh, application for a mobile phone, uh, things of that nature. Uh, all the same, like what, uh, based on a number of, 
on models then and, and optimization and a set of constraints, uh, we can find the best choice. Uh, and of course, you can fully take the step here and maybe integrate it with the purchase action in this case or the approval of a loan or the issuing of a particular service. Uh, and then uh, let me quickly touch a little bit on the model management. So as soon as we have put this stuff in place and we're running it, we want to monitor the performance of these models. Uh, we also want to be able to run them on the new data and in fact run through that old process we built before and maybe comparing different models and see which ones are best. And you can set all that up uh, you can also define certain criteria in which uh, uh, you want to be alerted. Maybe there are certain performance attributes of the models that you are particularly keen about. If they are improving or changing, please notify me, and then I can make a decision on whether to deploy that new model or not. So hopefully that gave you a, a quick overview of the capabilities of the Rapid Miner platform. So everything from accessing data, preparing it, building models, and then deploying and operationalizing those models, including the different phases here of schedule, trigger, or event-driven, and then also being able to really tie everything back together again, allowing you to do some model management or continuously monitor the performance of the models, uh, test them on new data, see if you can find even better models and deploy those. And this can, of course, be applied to many different types of examples. You know, I mentioned some loan applications, but you can even optimize around the loan rates, uh, insurance premiums, project bidding, uh, support call routing, for example. We have customers that use uh, this precise thing to take in a lot of uh, email-based uh, support cases, do some text analytics on those, make sure they get routed to the right teams uh, to put the right type of expert uh, in touch with the customer as soon as possible. Preventive maintenance or other use cases where, again, you can really go quite far and not only figure out maybe when something is, is, is in need of maintenance, but more interestingly, then really optimize around the scheduling of the maintenance because it's not just one machine that might need maintenance, right? You will have a whole park of them. When should you replace what parts of what pieces of equipment and, and schedule that in an optimal way? So all of these things are, are then examples and, and all possible with the Rapid Miner platform. Uh, so thanks with that, then I'll hand back to Haley, and um, uh, she'll take the Q&A from here. Great. Thanks, Lars. Uh, thank you so much, Mike and Lars, for a great presentation today. You covered a, a lot of really great information, and we appreciate your time. Um, so now it's time to get your audience questions. Um, so please feel free to enter your questions in the questions panel, and it looks like we already have a few questions that have come in. Uh, so we'll address those now. Um, so it looks like I have a question here for Lars. How can I automate it and use it in my big data environment? Uh, okay, good good question then. So uh, with big data, uh, you know, that could be a variety of things. If it's uh, related to, let's say, Hadoop, for example, which is a common platform now associated with big data, I guess, uh, we work very well with those systems. In fact, everything I showed you here can also be done on top of a Hadoop uh, cluster. So uh, all possible. Uh, also, we can... Uh, for example, what I showed here was a lot of processing within the Rapid Miner system, uh, but you can also, in the case of Hadoop, uh, even leveraging Spark and so on, push these type of uh, processes or models into those systems and let them execute down in, uh, in, in there instead of inside the Rapid Miner server. 
Great. Thanks, Lars. Uh, I have a question here for Mike. Uh, how do you recommend that organizations address the data scientist shortage? Um, so, um, you know, in, in one word, productivity, right? If you look at, you know, the, the, the tasks of a data science, which is to understand the data, acquire that data, prepare an analytical data set, and then iterate, iterate through a, you know, a, a modeling process, testing algorithms, creating features, and then operation, operationalizing that model. That's a fairly, uh, that's the same process uh, that's been used for quite some time. Right, so productivity is the key. And we've seen a trend uh, where uh, lots of data scientists are coding as well, um, like using open source R um, and maybe Python. And these are programming languages, right? So, so to some extent, you can do certain things in a custom fashion, but it's also a rather inefficient way uh, to simply apply an, a data operation. Um, to an analytical data set, right? So, so I think it's, it's all about productivity. It's looking at each one of those steps and try to make it per, per, uh, more productive. Uh, so the data prep stage, uh, the iterative stage of, of building that model, and of course what we've been talking about in this webinar is you know, reducing the friction uh, to oper operationalize models. You've got data scientists getting involved in lots of activities that they shouldn't be involved in. They should be focused on that modeling. So to the extent that tooling and platforms can help them stay focused on that, you'll make the existing data scientists you have more productive. So what's interesting here is, okay, you've got a team of six data scientists. Well, what if you could make them 30% more productive? Well, now you don't have a shortage anymore. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, looks like I have a question here for Lars. How do you work with ClickView? Uh, okay, yeah, we I mentioned that as an integration option. Uh, we do it in two ways, actually. Uh, the easy or simplest way is that you can uh, create or output uh, data into uh, ClickView readable formats. Uh, the other is a more bi-directional integration than which is what I explained more around this operationalization. And there, uh, the two products uh, can communicate through its respective API, uh, allowing uh, ClickView then to make a call over to RapidMiner uh, and get results back, which are then appended. Uh, they have a particular uh, feature there where you can append a column of data, let's say, to an existing data set. So that's the integration that's used in, in making that work. Great. Thanks, Lars. Um, I have a question here for Mike. Uh, what is the future of programming slash coding versus more modern drag-and-drop technology like we saw here with RapidMiner? I, I think both have a future, and I, and I think there's parallels to application development, right? So, uh, you know, back uh, when, when, when uh, computers started, uh, we were writing programs. It was all about programming languages, right? But if you look in any enterprise environment now, uh, you would never, for example, write a report in Java. Like if you needed a, a, a profit and loss statement, you, would, you just wouldn't do that. You'd use a more modern tool that basically abstracts um, a lot of that functionality. So the way I think about coding uh, versus drag and drop is productivity. You know, are there a certain set of functions and operators? In fact, are there hundreds that I can literally abstract? Because if I can abstract that, then I can construct uh, analytical and advanced analytical workflows uh, much more quickly. Is there a need for programming? Yes. There's, you know, sometimes you're, you're going to need to drop down into coding to do some very custom stuff. For example, algorithm development, um, or say you're going to do a particularly uh, gnarly ensemble that requires some coding, or you want to leverage some code that's out there. Um, so, I, so I think there's a there's a balance uh, between both of these, just as an application development. And you know, bottom line is, what is the fastest way? <laughs> to build a model, right? Because this is not a question about coding. Uh, it's not a question about the tooling. It's ultimately a question about that productivity. How can I build a model? How can I monitor that model? How can I streamline um, that entire process? 
Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, I have a question here for you, Lars. Um, can you talk about the differences of rapid prototyping, substantiation, and prototyping? Uh, sure, sure. So uh, the product uh, then supports uh, all those phases. The, the rapid prototyping is sort of what I showed with the uh, client in that demo. Uh, you can easily grab data, run it locally on your desktop, and uh, do things pretty quickly. Uh, then next, uh, with the substantiation there, uh, you might want to run on bigger data sets. Uh, you might, in fact, want to not load all the data into RapidMiner uh, because uh, of limitations of RAM or, or you want to leave it in its source. Uh, then you can do those in that phase. That's where you really are uh, testing the, the, your models on, on full data sets, uh, making sure that they are actually uh, maybe yeah, scoring or returning at the performance that you, you expect. Uh, and then finally, yeah, the deployment phase there, or, or again, operationalizing uh, the, the models there is, is again where uh, the server functionality kicks in, uh, the APIs are used, and some of these out-of-the-box integrations. I think there have been a few questions here, too, around what other things do we integrate with besides Salesforce, and yeah, you can do things with SAP. You can write back to all kinds of databases, uh, we leverage uh, uh, something called Zapier, which integrates with uh, uh, lots of different web-based tools. So if you have things in the cloud, for example, it's very easy to integrate with those. Uh, so a pretty rich set there. Uh, and again, too, to address that, maybe I think there was another question here around, you know, what about loading the data into your local repository and so on that... Uh, you don't, uh, yeah, you, you sort of disconnect from the proprietary data store or from the original data source. And you, again, can uh, uh, do both ways. Uh, it's easier sometimes to load the data and work on it locally like this, but you can also make, uh, have dynamic connections back to your databases and such through the product. I just didn't show it in that uh, quick little demo. Great, thank you, Lars. Um, so this one looks like it's for either Mike or Lars. Um, do you have any best practices of operationalizing using a platform like RapidMiner? Um, what works and guidance for enterprises? Yes, maybe I can uh, start that a little bit since it's related to uh, the product platform itself then. So, I mean, in many of these uh, uh, cases, I think it's... Uh, yeah, it's important to have the, some support by the other application owners and IT and so on uh, to make sure that you can put these uh, things in place in an effective way. Uh, also, I think what we've seen is uh, uh, making sure the business side is bought into the improvements that are going to be provided here uh, with these models. So a lot of it is, is not necessarily technical, uh, but organizational and project management oriented, uh, because you're starting to now move from this uh, experimentational or prototyping phase and really deploying things into your business and your production systems. Uh, so, so there are lots of elements around that, which I think uh, is important to consider and really take care of as you do this. Great. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, looks like I have another question coming in here. Uh, this one looks like uh, it's for Lars. Can the server be deployed in the technology environment of my company, or does it have to run in RapidMiner Cloud? Uh, great question, then. So uh, what I showed today and went through today is... Uh, all deployable on-premises. So uh, the system itself is really mainly built for desktop use and deployment on a local or uh, yeah, enterprise installed servers. We do have some cloud functionality as well uh, where you can uh, upload your data and your models and, and run them on uh, or in the cloud. 
And this is more of a solution for a, a smaller setup maybe or where you, you're a desktop user and you want to run some jobs in the background or, or run them without loading your desktop environment. Uh, but for what we went through today, uh, the best way to do that is to uh, uh, buy out the whole system here and deploy it on-premises. Great. Thanks, Lars. Um, so it looks like we still have a couple of questions coming in, but we're at the top of the hour right now. So if we didn't address any of your questions, uh, we'll make sure to uh, have someone follow up with you and address your question. Um, so I apologize if we weren't able to answer that on the line here today. So thanks again to everyone for joining us for today's presentation, and have a great day.